my name's Rick Salutin. I'm a freelance writer. Um, I've done a lot of theater and some fiction and an awful lot of journalism, always freelance, including um, columns for the Globe and Mail and the Star for over 25 years. Um, and I've always been uh, fascinated with political leadership conventions since I was a kid and watched I think Adlai Stevenson get nominated by the Democrats in the U.S. I find them kind of irritating, but utterly absorbing. Leadership conventions have got a bad rap in the last decade or so because um, they were seen as smoke-filled places where uh, the elites got into back rooms and made decisions uh, and deals. So the parties have gone to um, one member, one vote, and they can vote by phone or online across the country. This is seen as more democratic. I think it misses a point that the essence of democracy, is, which we always think the essence of democracy is voting, um, or that's what we were taught as we grew up. But uh, I think voting can be fairly uninformed and therefore not really very democratic. Um, you see it in election after election. Um, and what we leave out is that the other element of democracy that I think is really crucial is discussion, conversation, and consultation, which we don't have much here. People are expected to shut up, vote, shut up for another five years, then vote. But it's not really democratic unless there's uh, actual conversation and discussion. And that's where those old-fashioned leadership conventions where people used to come um, and make the decision, the delegates themselves made the decisions right on the floor. And it's true they got together and sometimes in secret, but there was real discussion and horse trading and back and forth. And in that sense, it represented um, ancient Athenian democracy much better than these um, electronic staged um, conventions, boring conventions that now happen now. I don't think the solution is to go back to the old kinds of leadership conventions, but I think that people who grew up online are much more familiar with um, back and forth and conversations. Their phones are never off. My kid's phone is never off. It's on during the night. He wakes up and checks it. If somebody's in trouble or wants to talk, they talk. So I think there is a kind of an orientation towards interaction. Um, among, um, I don't know, millennials um, that's, um, that may be unprecedented since Athens. I think if we lost leadership conventions and went to something else, there would be a gap, which is, I'm talking about the old-fashioned kind where they got together and horse traded and, you know, wore stupid hats and people crossed the floor back and forth. You'd lose something, but you're always going to lose something. The question is, what would you fill it in with? At the moment, this kind of electronic one member, one vote across the country with this artificial build-up to who's actually going to win when everybody already knows, probably days ago, who wins, that's no solution. That just um, alienates people and makes them think this whole process is a farce. So you have to find other, um, other forms of interaction which would almost inevitably be better than those leadership conventions because in a lot of ways they were stupid. But they did have that component of um, conversation and mind changing and people arguing with each other and trying to change their opinions, which I think is the essence of democracy. I, um, I knew a guy who was an anthropologist at uh, Cambridge, Jack Goody, Sir Jack Goody, um, now dead, and uh, he, asked, he was excellent on this question of uh, democracy, and I once asked him, what would you say is missing in the conversations about, that we have about democracy? And he said, it's about consultation. He said he, he studied, he lived with, with uh, tribes in, uh, in West Africa, and he said they would not be considered democratic by our means. But he said every time the, the, the chief made a decision, he never did it without going around the room and consulting with all of the people, not everybody, but with the people who represented the people who were in the tribe. And there was no way he would have done it or could have got away with it if he didn't. There was no voting anywhere. But there is that sense of, of taking... Uh, the opinion of the people involved into account.
I think what was interesting about the rise of the Reform Party is not that it was a right-wing movement, which it was, actually. Uh, and there was a kind of a reaction against what was seen as the kind of soft, cosmopolitan, Eastern-centered conservatism of the PCs. Um, and, and Preston was doubtless a very right-wing guy. But the part of it that I found really intriguing was the democratic uh, component. And he was really committed to grassroots democracy, and he really believed in following the lead of your constituents to the point that um, he took a poll among his members about, I, th I can't remember what the issue was, it might have been um, capital punishment, I think. And he was absolutely for it, as I recall. Um, and his members, uh, his constituents were against it, and he said, okay, I would go with, I would vote that uh, as they want if that came up. He was really committed. The real test for the party that he created was, were they going to be committed to democracy, uh, grassroots democracy, the way he was? And uh, as it turned out, no, they weren't. <laughs> the party went back to the kind of authoritarianism under Stephen Harper that he objected to under Brian Mulroney. Um, but Preston was a kind of a pure soul on that. I don't know what ultimate effect uh, Manning had. I would have liked the effect him, uh, for him to have to be at least as much on the democratic grassroots side as on the right-wing ultra-conservative side. It didn't work out that way. And when the, when the right finally came to power under Harper, um, they, uh, they were uh, more anti-democratic than anything that had come before. And they were more you know, fervently right-wing than, than anything that had come before. So I think it was a perversion of what uh, Preston uh, uh, had prom of the promise of Preston Manning. I think the abstract question of how do you change politics or parties uh, belongs in a seminar. Um, I think it, it all depends on how it unfolds in a particular moment. I mean, for example, in the last two years, we've lived through seeing Bernie Sanders almost take over the Democratic Party in the U.S. and Corbyn actually take over labor. I speak from, I speak from the left, basically. But I would have, and people I know would have been saying for decades, these parties are decrepit corpses, these so-called progressive parties, and the only hope is a new party founding a new party from the bottom up. It logically made sense. You would have won the argument in a seminar. But in fact, um, I think both Sanders and Corbyn have shown, at least at particular moments, that you'd be crazy to start a new party. You'd be slaughtered. Whereas there is some hope. You can at least put up a decent fight and have some hope of transforming these parties from within. So I think, you know, in terms of the Preston-Joe Clark argument, you could say, Preston may have been right back then when he and Joe Clark were having those arguments, but who knows today, Joe Clark might win that argument. In terms of the uh, convention, the conservative convention, the final PC leadership convention and the swan song of that party, combining with the alliance or with the reform people was not a major theme at that party. They thought they were going to keep it uh, together with themselves. Joe Clark had certainly taken the leadership in order to preserve the progressive conservative option, and he really believed in it. So a lot of that was under cover. At, at that convention, you didn't hear much talk. Uh, and uh, Chuck Strahl, the Western, uh, eventually cabinet minister under Harper, was more or less the voice of the reform side at that party. And I tried to you know, engage him on the floor about, uh, about these things. He was just cagey. He said, yeah, no, I don't know, maybe some, we'll see. Um, so they were keeping all of that under wraps. I think um, McKay either was in the bag by then or was certainly open to it. I talked to a lot of the old Red Tories before that convention, the people who'd been the heart of the party in the days of Stanfield and, uh, and then Joe Clark. I think they were, at that point, they were sensing the end was nigh. I, mean, I had a long talk with uh, Flora MacDonald, who was a real representative of that. 
And uh, she was vigorous, but she was whiny. And the, they all were whiny, actually. They felt the damn liberals had stolen all their good ideas. They never got a good, um, a good ride from the media. For some reason, the media were on their case and completely um, uh, indulgent toward the liberals. So in a sense, they were already writing their own obituary. Joe, um, well, we had a lovely um, dinner in the parliamentary dining room up there, really mellow and pleasant, and he seemed to be on top of everything. And at the end of it, I said, you know, Joe, you really seem to have a good grasp on, on these situations. Have you ever considered uh, trying to become prime minister? And he laughed and he said, well, the thing about these things is when you're young, you have the energy for dealing with these matters, but you lack the understanding. Then by the time you've got the understanding, you're just too old to have the energy to take it on. The convention did have a kind of schizophrenic quality. Um, I mean, the progressive and conservative had always seemed to me like contradictory, and I thought they were trying to just mush them together probably uh, in the time of the, uh, the New Deal in the 30s and the rise of left-wing um, politics. But actually, I think there was more to it. I think in, in some ways, the progressive side is what Preston Manning picked up on with the Reform Party in the sense of grassroots politics that paid attention to the farmers rather than, and, and to the grassroots rather than to the big moneyed interests. And, and in another sense, most politics is some kind of an unholy, you know, mishmash. Um, but I think David Orchard's candidacy actually, well, well a lot of, pardon me, there, uh, it was represented, for instance, by, there's Scott Bryson running for leader. And he was, I think, the most right-wing candidate at the time. He was like a guy who'd started subscribing to The Economist when he was 15 and had been converted like a youth for Christ or something. And it had never occurred to me that he'd ever be anything except a very right-wing voice. But once he lost and once the party went where it went, he suddenly switched, not pretty suddenly, switched over to the liberals, became um, a liberal um, uh, critic when they were in opposition, and then a cabinet minister, and is completely mouthing the liberal uh, line. And as far as anyone could tell, sincerely, so these things happen. Then there's David Orchard with this iconic name, um, uh, like, uh, like the poet Milton, Milton Acorn. And this guy, David Orchard from the prairies, he'd been a kind of a left-wing guy. He'd been active in the anti-free trade movement in the late 80s and early 90s. He developed a kind of a cult around himself. But any, and, and his main advisor was uh, Mary Ellen Arepo, who'd been a a leftist, a Trotskyite, uh, you know, really a long-standing person uh, on the left. So I thought, and he somehow concocted a position for himself that he represented the voice of true conservatism going back to Disraeli in the 1800s. Um, and he had people there who believed that he had a, you know, substantial delegation. I remember being knocked out when I saw somebody standing on a chair at the convention with a sign that said orchard going orchard orchard and uh, i thought that guy's familiar he turned around it was anton qwerty the concert pianist who has recorded all of beethoven's um, um i guess the maybe the concertos and the sonatas i don't know and uh and he had run for the ndp as a candidate, but he was in their heart and soul. It was bizarre. So I think you do get this kind of unholy mix at these things. And um, eventually the decision they made more or less reflected that. I had, I had tried to talk to Peter McKay beforehand um, and he do had dodged me. Um, I, I think, I don't know. Um, but I ran into him on one of those um, those rickety flights that landed at the island airport then. Um, and he's a, I mean, he was a kind of a dumb blonde. And he didn't say much, but he looked, he was photogenic, you know, he looked good. And he tried to fake answers, like on the Middle East. It was just an embarrassment. He knew nothing. And uh, he was the son of a cabinet minister and a real player in the Maritimes. Um, and uh, I, 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 you had the sense that he was carrying a chip on his shoulder.
from uh, his relationship with his dad. It hadn't gone smoothly. I speak as someone whose relationship with my dad didn't go smoothly. Um, and you never quite knew what it was about with him. Looking back at that convention, I would say that there was a sense that this is the denouement of, uh, of, Canadian, uh, of Johnny MacDonald's Conservative Party. Um, it, was, it was a bit wan, you know, but it was a sense that these people were trooping into some kind of a funeral. They pulled it together for one last event. Now, not that they were going to um, merge with the, uh, with the dark side, uh, which is what they did shortly after that, but that they were going to kind of dwindle away, which would have been more, a more dignified way to go than just offering themselves up to the maw of the uh, right-wingers in the reform movement. Nobody um, had, it, going into the convention, it was clear that um, nobody was going to sweep the other side away. You weren't going to have a big first ballot victory. So there was going to be some horse trading. Um, especially since everything happened on the convention floor. It wasn't one of these phone-in, mail-in um, uh, votes that have, have since taken over. But it was unclear which way it was going to go, and uh, David Orchard seemed like he was just obstinate. He wasn't going to go anywhere. I had uh, season tickets to the, or shared season tickets to the Blue Jays, and they were right next door. And there's a long time between ballots, so I went and watched a couple of innings uh, between, uh, between ballots. And I ran into uh, Orchard with his small retinue, and I thought, I will take a chance with this guy and see if I can suggest to him maybe he should make a deal, but there's no chance that he will. He's just going to stick obstinately to his own to the end. And he looked at me a bit kind of, um, you know, kind of Buddha-like, like, uh, you know, sort of cryptically and knowingly, and just nodded. So I should have known at that point that something was going to happen, that he was the card that was in play. Um, but they did the usual back and forth. I think Scott Bryson uh, went over to Jim Prentice, who I think had led on the first ballot. And the, there were these things, I mean, they are kind of bizarrely and kind of cheap theatrics where the leader of one party uh, uh, goes over to somebody who's about to drop off the ballot and to convince them to bring their delegates. You cross the floor, you go up and talk to that guy who's about to drop off, then maybe he leads his party across to you, or maybe he gets halfway across the floor and turns around and goes back or goes to somebody else. It was that kind of thing. It was fun, actually. It was certainly fun to be there. It's actually fun to watch on TV, I think, too, because I watched a number of them on uh, TV. The Americans have long since done away with that, but we still had some semblance of it here. And Scott uh, Bryson made uh, his, his move towards, um, towards Prentice. And then the question was, what the hell is going to happen with, uh, uh, on the next ballot? Um, Orchard was the, only, was the one about to drop off. And he had a substantial number of these diehards like uh, pianist Anton Querty. And, um, but they were devoted to him. There was that kind of cultish quality which was not unknown on the left in, in those years, uh, the cult of the leader. And, um, and they went up and they, uh, Peter I guess went up or David went up and had a chat they were in, in these bleachers that they had and they made um, some kind of a deal. And uh, David announced he was taking his people over to Peter on the basis of a signed agreement. And the, uh, the, the, the signed agreement that he made had at least two components. One was a review, a serious review of free trade, which had been his, his lost leader, David Orchard's, you know, he's against free trade. That never meant anything anyway. And the other was a solemn promise from Peter McKay <clears throat> that the PCs, the conserv his conservatives would never, uh, at least in the, um, in the foreseeable parliamentary term, merge with the right-wing alliance. And uh, <laughs> McKay happily signed, and uh, uh, Orchard felt he'd won a victory, and he took them over. And it was kind of hard-hearted politics. It was actually almost kind of Leninist or Maoist, where you make a real analysis of the forces that are at work, and you decide who is the main enemy, 
and who can I ally with in order to smite the main enemy? <clears throat> At some point I may have to take them on, but for the moment we can make alliances. Um, I, I naively felt that it would be unthinkable for Peter McKay to sign this agreement and in less than a year just act as if it didn't exist. Um, I thought I knew what politics was like, but I, that seemed to me beyond the pale. As for Orchard, um, in, he was a kind of shit disturber. When I asked Lowell Murray, who was one of the PCs still in the Senate, and he may have been the leader of their caucus in the Senate, and I asked him, how would Dal Dalton Camp have voted at this convention? Dalton had died a year before, and I, I sort of revered Dalton. I missed him terribly. And, uh, and he said Dalton would have voted for Orchard, but Dalton was a shit disturber. Um, the rest of them, um, you know, in theory you can say, yes, he was the avatar of the spirit of progressive conservatism. Orchard was the avatar of the spirit of progressive conservatism. But actually it was a fraud and they all knew it. Orchard didn't really belong. He wasn't one of theirs. He'd moved in there, he developed a shtick about Disraeli and John A. MacDonald and the spirit of conservatism. It was crap. Really, he was a kind of a um, self-absorbed leftist with an anti-free trade position and a kind of a social democratic general view who had managed to shoehorn himself into the PC thing and probably convinced himself that he belonged there. Um, but the rest of them I don't think ever took it very seriously. Somehow he got on the ballot so he had to deal with them as McKay did, but I don't think there was any way that those, um, that people even like Hugh Siegel, I mean, uh, yeah, even people like Hugh Siegel, I don't think there's any way that they could have really felt uh, comfortable and at home with David Orchard. There was a kind of a um, uh, pantomime quality about it all. Theoretically, there was something contradictory about them not really taking Orchard seriously and about McKay being able to just ignore this thing he'd signed. But there is, you know, there are anthropologically other things at work in politics, and there's a deep tribalism, and basically you, you can almost smell if this is a member of your tribe or not. And uh, Dalton was. Nobody would have said Dalton Camp or Joe Clark were not conservatives because they, even the most right-wing people, the Mulroneyites, they might have hated Dalton or Hugh Siegel, but they would never say they're not conservatives. They're just conservatives who we despise. They're not our kind of conservatives. That's the tribalism. You, you sort of sniff around and you can tell this is, you know, us. Uh, and it happens in every party. It happens with the NDP. It happens with the Liberals. Um, but with Orchard, they took a sniff, and I think, and they just knew this guy is, he's, he's scamming uh, us in some way. And, you know, with Anton Querty pumping his sign, you know, it's just, um, they got in, they got in the door, and they weren't going to, they, they didn't, you know, they, they allowed them in the door, that was their right. But uh, I don't think they were ever considered members of the tribe. Now, I would say, you know, it did, sh the deal that McKay made with David Orchard really shocked the um, press corps, for instance. I may have been in the um, press room uh, at the time, just off the main floor watching it on TV. And I remember national columns, syndicated columnists gnashing their teeth. And I don't think they were cursing McKay. I think, no, I don't think they were cursing Orchard. They were cursing McKay. Um, this was somehow backroom foul deal making. It had no principle involved in it. It was baloney, you know. It was just uh, um, they didn't know, for instance, what was going on, what McKay was uh, eventually going to be capable of. But there was a real sort of a, a, um, a pseudo shock or a genuine shock. Maybe the last bastion of you know true belief in naivete in the realm of formal politics is the press, not, not, the, not in the parties themselves. I am not surprised that McKay reneged and that, that he lied <clears throat> and then just went back on it. I'm a little surprised at how bland he was about it, but he's a bland guy. He's sort of, you know, he's not a deep thinker. He does this, then he does that, and he doesn't really let contradictions bother him very much. What I find surprising
is that the guy went on to have a, a, a political career. It seems to me, um, and this is my naivete, that how could that guy walk down a street ever after that without pe people saying, you liar, and crossing the street not to have to go by him. It just seems to me such a blatant act of uh, cynicism and, um, and just dishonesty. You cannot, and people lie, but you cannot present yourself as a serious political democratic leader, except you can <laughs> and get away with it. I feel the same way about Maroney. I don't know how the guy goes out in public after having taken shopping bags full of cash from Carl Heinz Schreiber. Um, I'm not surprised Mulroney did it, but I am surprised that people allow him to have not just a normal, but a kind of a respectable and fetid social life where he goes and gives speeches and appears in places and everybody treats him as if he's not the pariah that he ought to be. So I don't quite get that. I don't think that the ascension of Stephen Harper to leadership of the United Conservatives Party uh, was an event within itself. We were, I mean, think about it, the, um, the Soviet bloc had imploded at the beginning of the uh, 1990s and um, uh, a kind of um, brutal capitalism tr was triumphant. And all the parties were into it. We had a so-called liberal government in the 1990s in which Paul Martin just decimated all the programs that his own father, Paul Martin Sr., had brought in as a liberal in the 1960s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and I think it was, in a way, <clears throat> Paul Martin who picked up the mantle of whatever history was offering at that time and was a kind of a brutal um, slasher of social programs and a devotee of the free market. Uh, Martin had a kind of Tourette's-like quality where sometimes he'd bark out um, uh, old slogans that his father would have said, but he never did anything about it. So that by the time Harper took over the conservatives, um, I think savvy voters would have just said, look, we're going to get this in one form or another. We're going to get it in this kind of sloppy form that Martin gives it, gives us. So we're going to get it in the um, uh, straight form that we get it from Harper. Uh, that didn't mean they'd vote for Harper, but it meant there wasn't a lot of dismay. And the NDP was moving in that direction, too, with Jack Layton. Jack had been a kind of card-carrying, you know, serious leftist. And then he was convinced when he became leader of the NDP that we've got to go with um, uh, market forces and we've got to get rid of this ugly word socialism wherever we can. Um, and we're only seeing the, you know, um, the reversal of some of that, those attitudes in the last few years. And it's not because of any particular party or leader, it's just history kind of moves and swerves and goes its own way. I think there's a way in which we're just the playthings of historical forces, you know. But that doesn't mean that you're absolved of, of being critical and taking a stand. And in a way, if you don't get your way now, and you have to live with the awful results like Paul Martin and Stephen Harper, uh, from my point of view. Uh, nevertheless, you're, you know, you're, you're depositing something in the account for the future. You don't, uh, you don't give up and you're not uh, allowed to just opt out and say, oh, history's going its course, because it just doesn't work that way. I'm a sucker for anything that even remotely resembles genuine democratic activity. And so I like those kind of ragged conventions where stuff happens that you didn't know. I felt the same way about the uh, liberal convention where Stefan Dion <coughs> emerged over the favorites, uh, Michael Ignatieff and Bob Ray. He was a disaster. And yet, um, it was I exhilarating to be there because you actually see people talking. And when I think about it, I, I, I find actually I'm much more exhilarated by those conventions than by elections, even where my guy wins. Because you're watching on television, you know, it's just a bunch of votes being counted, nobody's having a conversation. Whereas the real entanglement and the back and forth, and, and the, even when those things come out ways you might not like, it's so exhilarating to be part of it. The, 
Um, the most exhilarating political moment of my life was the free trade election of 1988, a long time ago now. But I was engaged in it in a way I never thought I would be. I, would, I put out some material with Terry Mosher, the cartoonist, Aislinn, that was used on the anti-free trade side, and it kind of um, impacted the election intensely. I was also writing a book about it at the time, so it was the best of both worlds. I was both a participant in the election, and I'd go to... Um, rally to campaign events where the conservatives would try to savage what Terry and I had done, but I'd also be interviewing them for my book. So I was both an active person and a writer. And that's sort of, um, that's like no matter what happens, because anything you do in politics is going to get reversed, it's going to be problematic. Progress is very slow. You can't control it. But there are those moments of um, where you see people, citizens, being, people being citizens, not just voters. And being a citizen means you're engaged, you care, you think your voice matters and your voice is being heard. And those are the moments, I think, that actually um, renew your uh, belief in uh, whatever it is that we mean by democracy. I think, in general, the media coverage is okay to tell you what's happening moment to moment, but has very little uh, insight into the underlying forces. Um, I, 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 that's not like me turning on my own. I've always been a freelancer and an outsider. I've never had a job in any media institution. Um, but I think, for instance, um, when you've got a job to do and you do it for decades, the way people who you know, climb up in the media world do, you just get um, enmeshed in everything you've learned and know how to do. So I think where it came out most recently was in um, the liberal promise to um, revamp our electoral system and to have electoral reform. Uh, it eventually crashed for various reasons. Um, but the media was probably the most unified voice against making any changes to our crappy uh, electoral system where again and again you get <clears throat> a minority of voters uh, being represented by a majority of seats in the House. That's like, you know, uh, democratic stupidity 101. And you got to, you know, anything would be better than that. But the voice of... Um, media, especially punditry, was astonishingly unified against it. And I think it's just because they got used to covering politics in a certain way and they couldn't imagine, oh man, what's going to happen here? We have to relearn how to do this. We've spent our careers developing ways of covering these leadership campaigns and elections and they're going to go and throw a whole new system at it at us, that means some, you know, pup, some young pups out of journalism school may be able to handle it better than we do. I don't know if that's the reason, but I don't think that they are um, uh, very, uh, they're very good for uh, details of what's going on in the inside. Not a lot of uh, use for overviews. In general, I think that the people who rise to the top in any area are probably the shabbiest people available. Um, partly because, you know, uh, I mean, in politics, you know, the people who become leaders are usually who, what, what kind of decent, well-developed, well-integrated personality would want to spend their lives leading a political party? You've got to have some sort of complicated, um, um, probably ugly motives. Once in a while, and this is true, I think of people in the media too, you know, how do you get to the top, you basically? Uh, to a large extent, you gotta, um, you gotta, um, you gotta trim your sails. You gotta please your bosses. You gotta do this and that. I think what's amazing is not how many, not very um, impressive people rise to the top in every area, including media and politics, because. I think you can find lots of reasons why the not impressive people rise to the top. It's that occasionally you really do get very good people. Anyhow, defying those uh, forces. Speaking about kids, like my kid who's uh, almost 19, I feel really guilty about the world that we're handing them, especially the work world, which is just a shambles. And it's, you know, it's, it's probably already outdone the inequities of feudalism um, as far as uh, who, gets, who has a chance or how many people have a chance. Politically, um, they are engaged, I think. 
actually, I think they've always been engaged. I mean, I started teaching a half course at the U of T decades ago, and um, uh, students would often say, oh, we're sorry we missed the 60s, and I would try to convince them it was mostly kind of rhetoric, and you know, it was a good trip, but it wasn't that substantial. And I've never thought that, that, that the young change that much. I don't think, I, I don't believe in this kind of demographic categorization. What I'd say about kids like my, my kid is their sense of community with their peers is astonishing. Like, they are a really social generation. That thing of the phone um, going mm, beside you while you're asleep and you pick it up and you say, oh, my pal so-and-so is in trouble, wants to talk, and you, I mean, you text. Um, I think they have a sense of what, and, and, and the norm for them is being socially connected, whereas the norm for every human generation since the dawn of time has been disconnection and solitude out of which you, you step into social connection from time to time. So I think, in short, they are poised to be the most socialist generation that ever existed. They're not afraid by social, uh, they're, not, they're not scared off by social connectedness. I don't know where that's going to go. It's certainly not going to be, I don't think it's going to be the NDP. I don't, think, I don't know if it's going to be electoral politics. But there is an openness that emerged, for instance, how come Bernie Sanders could call himself a socialist and he wasn't dead in the water? We all thought that. But there is a, you know, there are a couple of generations out there now to whom socialism is not a scary term. And it's not just because they didn't live through the Cold War. It's because social to them, it's a good thing.